there's too many of you crying. Believe. Brother, 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 there's too many of you dying. That is a nice package. You know we got to fly away. This is a big, big uh, package. What do you mean? 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 kill everything in front of me, man. That's the main thing. What will the leader be? I have no idea. For that, we're going to go to the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline in just a minute. It is bumper to bumper. Guardsy in the big chair for most of the day today. But we will check in with the host, Dan Barrero, including right now. That is the question. If you were sitting in this chair and not on the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline, what would we be the leader of today on this Monday, Dan Barrero? Well, probably properly embarrassed leader because i i'm not gonna lie to you i think you and i both thought that they could win this series and would win this series we tried to talk people off the ledge a couple sundays ago right yep but i had a couple things i needed to get done that i've been putting off so i said okay let's look at the schedule the next few weeks what's a what's a day that realistically is not going to be an epiphany day a huge day in the history of minnesota sports the monday after game four because the wolves might split in phoenix but they're not going to sweep in phoenix that's just not likely to happen so i said okay i'll take my chances and i'll take that you know today as the day i'm going to get some of those things done that don't allow me to be in the studio and so i'm now properly chastened that i didn't believe in the i believe in the club yeah but i clearly didn't believe in them enough because part of it is I also didn't want to extend it too far in the other end because I assume they're going to win. I go, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to miss time once we get into the next round, right? So it seemed to be the sweet spot, the perfect day. And then Anthony Edwards and company just, they had to go out and ruin it by taking the series and taking, and I'm not kidding about this, the National Basketball Association nationally by storm. After game three, I had a sneaky suspicion mm-hmm. it was going to be a sweep. Yes. Not because of how the Wolves played, which was another dominant effort. You knew that Phoenix was yep. going to play better, and they did. The Wolves had to keep up with they them for better. a while. Yep. But when Anthony Edwards was asked in the post-game news conference, do you feel like you've broken their spirit? And I don't think he's ever answered a question more quickly than when he said, no, we don't break the spirit until we win game four. There was not going to be any messing around in game four. They might not win the game, but it wasn't going to be what we've seen kind of all over the NBA, including in the most recent uh, the series that continues tonight, yeah. Denver and L.A., where they weren't going to be as sharp. They maybe not, weren't going to be as good, and, and down the stretch, they weren't going to get it done. After game three, and I heard Ant talk like that. Now, this is obviously unprovable, and it had, had Phoenix won yesterday, I might not have been surprised. But just the way he set the tone, it seemed like, the whole series, but certainly in games three and games four, and specifically after game three, I said, well, this might be a wrap on Sunday because Ant seems pretty dialed in. What do you think? Yeah, I think I, I, I will add to that that when I was on sermons yesterday, we had uh, Alan Horton on, and Horton didn't flat out predict game four sweep, but you could tell he wasn't going to be at all surprised. that He thought, like most people, the Suns' spirit, seem to have been broken badly and they were kind of backbiting each other. There was body language issues between the head coach and a couple of the players. And by the way, you can see the head coach has already been, I mean, he's already, he might as well just quit. Well, he won't quit. He probably wants his money, but yeah. he's being sacrificed already. It's all his fault, which is absurd. Shams had but, that story written 10 minutes after the t- the final buzzer last night. It was crazy. It was bizarre. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. It's a good story maybe for another day, but there's no question it was in the back of my mind that, yeah, now at this point after game three, 
you know, it was definitely possible. This was the first game I thought, as good as Edwards has been, to me, this, this was the first game where in the fourth quarter, you just became convinced that he literally was not going to miss a shot. Yep. He, he, he was going for that, that sort of dagger that we do associate you know, with the very, very best players, and uh, he, he was absurd. I mean, I think he only had two turnovers to go with the – how did he hit 40, 41, whatever it was? 40 points. points, yep. Another not – was it another nine rebounds? Nine another rebounds, rebound six assists, game. yep. Six assists, hey, it's, 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 it's. We're in that We're in that air now. There's no question about – this is what, obviously, people have kind of been waiting for, and, and, and that's what we saw. And a lot of people – somebody sent me the video – is it CJ Zero? I can't remember the guy who always has good captures, good mm-hmm. video. I don't know if he's league wide or the Wolves. And it was that defensive stand late in the game. Yep. In a game where, by the way, their defense start to finish had actually been leakier than it had been in previous games. But key moment of the game, and Phoenix keeps moving the ball, trying to stay ahead of a Wolves defender getting right up on the three point line on whoever the, the would be shooter was. And they kept, you know, turning it, and the Wolves kept answering it with a with a defender right there. It almost, it looked like the Wolves had seven or eight defenders on the court. Mm-hmm. That's how aggressive and how effective, and that's the one that ended with the uh, Nikhil Alexander Walker steal, if you recall. And that's what you that's what you say for for posterity, right? If if this team does make a run this year beyond just the first round series, that to me is going to be well. There, that symbolizes it where literally no matter how many times the other team does what they're supposed to do, right, swing the ball, you've got a defender, a particularly sticky defender, in your face, forcing you to to, to, to swing it one more, you know, to the next player. And by the end of the deal, they're so good at defending it that you lose the possession entirely. We're talking with Dan Barrero on the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline. This is Bumper to Bumper. Guardsy in the big chair today. You heard Dan at the beginning say a scheduled load management day. Uh, we've got Jace Frederick at the bottom of the hour. We've got Johnny Athletic at the bottom of the hour. And we'll call you sometime in the four as well. Um, okay. We also have a, um, we basically have a montage of every national person possible and what they're saying about Anthony Edwards. Because as you can imagine, there's a lot. Um, but that that defensive stand that you talked about, I tweeted about it four seconds later, where if you mm-hmm. wanted to just sum, you know summarize the Wolves, the 2024 Wolves in 20 seconds, it was that defensive stand, which I think Phoenix had eight passes, all properly yep. defended on both sides of the court, ending up with a steal, and then it gets into the hands of Anthony Edwards, who just drives by and puts the exclamation point on it. That puts him mm-hmm. up four, and at that point, it's pretty much a wrap, right? Some other stuff had to happen, including the head coach being carted off, which we'll talk about. Oh, my God. But that's yeah, the unbelievable. That's the 20 to 30 seconds. If you just wanted, who are the Timberwolves in 2024? You send them that 30 seconds, yeah, and you go, this is it. them, right? And that was really the key to the that's series no that you and I talked about the, the last two weeks. What bothered us most about the regular season games against Phoenix was that it wasn't the team that had been the Wolves for 80-plus no. games. They were kicking the ball all over the place. They weren't guarding anybody. Phoenix was freewheeling, footloose, fancy free, mocking everybody on the court. And the Wolves, in a sense, remembered who they they were and have been mm-hmm. in these last four games. Well, yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, and again, you know, we got into this subject again yesterday on sermons, and you and I have probably talked about it, too. It's you know, it's a really cool calling card to have in a league that obviously is more about offense than defense. And by the way, to win, even if you have a good offense, you have to have a legitimate defense. But no team has really made it its signature to the degree, in recent memory at least, to the degree that the Wolves have. And if you're a fan, to me that's an added, now the, you know, it's an added bonus. The big bonus is you're out of the first round for the mm-hmm. first time in 20 plus years. But an added bonus is, well, this is really unique. How far can this go? Because how often do we see this many players, including, by the way, Carl Anthony Towns, who was magnificent yesterday, um, this engaged in it, as in welcoming it, as in, no, no, we're not doing this just because we have to. We're doing this because we love this. And I think that's the best part about it. And, you know, Barkley, I thought Barkley after the game, he was very high on Edwards, but he was actually a little bit more... What's the term I'd use? A um, little more, more low key than um, than Kenny Smith. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
Hello? Wobble bingo? Wobble bingo. All right. We'll uh, maybe try calling him back after the break. I know he had more to say. Uh, we will do that. We'll uh, we'll call Dan back after the break. We've got Jace Frederick at the bottom of the hour. 3.30 is when he will join. I think landing from Phoenix, he was in Footprint Center for games three and games four. Johnny Athletic will make his weekly Monday appearance at 5.30. And I do. I did mention we've got what they're saying about Anthony Edwards. I also want to know what you have to say about Anthony Edwards and the Timberwolves and just how you're feeling in general on watching something that hasn't happened in 20 years. The last time the Timberwolves opened a series and won a series was 2004. They had never swept a series before. No major Minnesota sports team had swept a series before in the best of seven. So we'll talk about all of that when we come back with Barrero. But first, I think we have a grand to try to put in somebody's hand. We do. The fan at BigDeck.com. I'm going to give you a shot to put a grand in your hand at the National Cash Contest. Head to KFAN.com and the keyword bills for this hour. The keyword is bills. KFAN.com. Keyword bills. More bumper to bumper with Dan Barrero on the phone when we come back. If you want to chime in on what's happening in your favorite KFAN shows, you can make your voice heard on the Bradshaw and Brian KFAN text line. Just let us know what you have to say by texting that message to 64686. That's 64686. Standard text message and data rates apply. Yeah, hit the Bradshaw and Brian KFAN text line, as Brett just said, 64686. Also hit the talk back of your iHeartRadio app. We're going to play a bunch of talkbacks today throughout the show. You've got 30 seconds. You hit the microphone icon right there. When you get to KFAN on the iHeartRadio app, we'll do a lot of those in the 4 o'clock hour, so load them up now. We'll do kind of a Timberwolves talkback day. Uh, Alan Horton. 113 to 111. And one-on-one against Bradley Beal. Beats some baseline. Rises and hammers. What a finish by Anthony Edwards. Big time dunk by Ant. 27 points in the second half. And he rocks the rim and oohs and ahs even from the Suns fans here in the building. He's put the Wolves up four with 2.12 left to play. And they would not relinquish that lead. We're going to go back to Barrero here on the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline. Guardsy filling in today. Jace Frederick coming up next segment. Johnny Athletic at 5.30. When you were rudely interrupted, Dan, you were talking about Kenny Smith being a little bit more... I should say Charles Barkley, I think, being a little bit more understated than Kenny Smith or vice versa. Take us through the uh, what, what you yeah, were saying Kenny, there. Yeah, Kenny basically, although I, part of Kenny's point was, I think, was to troll Charles because <laughs> he basically said, well, Charles, the, the Wolves have answered every one of the questions you had. You're the guy who said it wasn't going to work with the two big men. You're the one who said blah, blah, blah. And so Kenny basically said, I think they answered every question. Charles being Charles said, well, hold on a minute. Congratulations. It's great to get out of the first round, but uh, I'm not going to crown them yet until they play a less fundamentally flawed team. And that's what's going to be interesting going forward mm-hmm. because the truth is, I think Phoenix is. I mean, when, when, if you go back to when they made that the, the move for, for Beal, it, it, it wasn't logical because it was from the beginning, I think, understood by some of us is they're too top heavy. They don't have enough role players. They got no bench. And how is it going to work with three? primary scorers anyway and we kind of found out right that it's limited how it's going to work and to that extent i think charles has a point on the other hand i think this is what i'm sure you feel good about and what i think wolves fans should feel good about they didn't win a title right there's no commemorative print for getting out of the first round except maybe in maybe in this town because of how long it's taken (laughs) but in all honesty it's the, it's the declarative way in which they did it, right? Right. They didn't sort of like back into it. They didn't luck into it. They blew the mother bleeping door down, right? I mean, that's what they did. They absolutely exposed. If Phoenix is limited, they they completely exposed them, which is what you know really good contending teams are supposed to do. So to me, that's why I think you can make a bigger deal of it than generally we would associate with. All they did was get out of the first round, man. They're in the conference semifinals. It's the way they did it, right? Which yes. I think is part of the reason around the league, there's already a feeling of, ah, Denver, that's, that's going to be interesting. Right. That's going to be fun. That's going to be, that's not going to be a walk in the park for Denver, which, by the way, has actually looked a little vulnerable against the Lakers. The Lakers just can't finish right. at this point. And now I think Murray's hurt, which is an interesting wrinkle that might end up affecting, even, you know, eventually the Wolves series, too. So, I, to me, that's why it is. It's. It's. Yeah, I don't think anybody in Wolves Nation has to apologize for celebrating to the degree that I know they are. And the component, I think Johnny wrote about this a little bit. That you know, you grew up with this team. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you're in the wheelhouse of it. You thought they were going to leave. It, you know, we've gone through all the ups and downs, but mainly the downs, just the stupid personnel moves that Joe Smith did. This is a, all the fiascos that were kind of norm, the, you know, par for the course. And so for, I feel good for you. I feel good for all those rubes who have been through all the garbage. I mean, just awful basketball. Yep. And, and now to have a little something to, to flex about because you and I know. This isn't just about this season now, right? right? This is about you're establishing yourself as a force that maybe you have to, you may have to improve here, improve there. They're not the perfect team yet, right. but there's no reason that this team cannot be a factor for a while in the Western Conference. Well, and when you factor in, they almost have, I was thinking about this today, and, and I'm, I'm worrying about myself extending windows because, as we know, like nothing is guaranteed in anything, right? Like True. This is why, yeah. you know, face down Denver, and I, I, it's going to be Denver, and I think that's going to be an absolute bloodbath of a series. I think it's going to be great. Mm-hmm. But you start looking at it, and you start thinking about how Nikhil Alexander-Walker is coming along. A couple, you know, a year or two left on his contract. Yeah. Conley's already saying, like, he's going to take over for me when I'm done, you know, even though Conley's going to be mm-hmm. here for a while. Um, at least another year or two. Nas Reed is still young, so you're like, okay, then maybe he slides in for the Rudy role whenever Rudy... You, know, you can kind of see like a succession of... It's not just going to be Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns four, five, six years from no. now, potentially. And I think that's the, the cool part about it. Now, I immediately snap myself back to reality and go, let's worry about the Nuggets, dude, and let's handle the Nuggets because... <laughs> If, right. You never know when your opportunity is going to come here. You look around at even some of the injuries that are going around the NBA right now, right? Like you just, you're never guaranteed to be in a spot like this no. where your head coach is the guy on the injury report now, which, uh, what were you thinking when that whole thing went down? Oh my God. I, I, well, I did actually, I was sort of shaking my head like I'm sure a lot of Wolves fans saying, God, our moment of triumph, finally, a breakthrough. And of course, what happens to the Wolves? They lose their coach to a bad knee injury at the end of the game. And before you kind of, you know, while the adrenaline rush is going, you're already thinking ahead in a callous way, right? Sure. Uh, beyond the human cost, you're going, my God, is he going to be available? I mean, I, are they going to be able to? I mean, he's an important part of it. He's a cog in the machine. Here. Mm-hmm. He's finchy. He's helped bring them along. Is he even going to be available to coach? I, I, I could I could hear the, sp- the wheels spinning and people shaking their heads and going, couldn't we have given given our having five minutes to really celebrate this and enjoy this before we the head coach? How often has it ever happened in NBA history? I've never seen it. I, my wife asked me that because has that ever oh, happened I before? I said I don't. Yeah, I don't. I've seen coaches. There was a uh, there was a college coach, Ron Hunter, that hurt himself yeah. celebrating Remember? once and then had to wheel himself around in the, the for the rest of the tournament. Big dance. And so yeah. that that was what I remembered and how funny that was. I don't remember the injury, but. Where you know now you got to have patellar tendon surgery apparently and have <laughs> yeah. to have a knee brace on. And apparently he can coach, but you know he's going to be sitting next to yeah. Glenn essentially. I mean, do you put do you have to elevate the leg up? Does he sit in the second row? I don't mean to like make fun of it, but it is uh, no, like it's no. just a bizarre set of circumstances that poor Finchie, you know, is is yeah. going to be seated. It looks like or at least standing with crutches. I don't even know how it's going to work for game one. Well, as odd as it sounds. As odd as it sounds, you, because there's a part of me that says, well, he, he directs the same way he directs, and maybe he'll be able to do that. But, you know, and I know human nature, again, being what it is, right. there's there's part of his, your comfort of, okay, and he's not a guy who's demonstrative on the sidelines, but he's up, yes. right? Yes. He's up a decent amount. He's in and out. It helps maybe him stay connected to what's going on out there. And the fact that he's going to have to be, you know, well, not on a gurney, I hope, but at least, you know, like you say, just sort of uh, on, a, on, a, on a big chair with his, I don't know, his foot propped up. I right. don't even know what the hell you're going to do. Right. Is, um, it's going to make for some very interesting uh, camera angles, I'm sure, because that'll end up being a huge story in the next round. What did you see from Carl this entire series and certainly last night? Yeah. Well, I saw, I think, A, well, the, the consummation of his acceptance of the reality that it is Anthony Edwards' team. And you could argue he's already acknowledged that and shown it to a, to a large degree with how magnanimous he's been all along. But to me, the beauty of last night was Edwards, to an extent, is now quite possibly in the perfect situation, okay? Because I do think there was reason to wonder whether, if it mattered, he is a one. If you want to buy that nonsense about Alpha or Batman and Robin, whether he could literally be the guy who's at the top of the food chain. 
And he doesn't have to worry about that anymore. He knows it. The league, whole league knows it. And he looked very comfortable. The old let the game come to me yep. sort of situation. I don't think he's forcing as much because to a certain extent now the pressure's off and he doesn't have to. And if the team succeeds, guess what? He's going to get plenty of accolades, right? He's going to get plenty of attention. He's get, people aren't going to be down on him to the degree, in fact, that they were before. His whole reputation will be transformed. But in large measure, I think it's what we were talking about earlier. Um, he's never going to be, you know, um, uh, compared favorably to some of the great shutdown inside defenders in the league. But he is so much more willing yep. and so much better. And you saw it almost seemed to build through the series to where this game last night, he's right there. Okay. Whoever's out here, is it a guard? Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll take his ass on. You're not, you know, you might, you might get past me, but I'm going to make it tough for you. And so having that added, uh, you know, I guess you could say, uh, are in his added to his arsenal, I think is, is all good. That's about to me, you know, as well as he, as he's, he's played in, in any sort of, you could say pressure situation, don't you think? Yeah, and just they need him. I mean, the scoring, he's mm-hmm. so effortless in the shooting and the scoring, and he was great last night, and, and I still don't, he's never going to be a great back-to-the-basket post player, and I don't think that's the best use of him. And they kind of put him in like the mid post a little bit, the short corner, and just said, yeah. just, just drive by the guy and use your height. And he mm-hmm. did that a couple of different yeah. times. And on that on that um, defensive play that we talked about that everybody's talking about, he starts it with a good contest of a three. He goes and doubles Durant. Mm-hmm. Then he comes over for the last help on the Beal drive to force the errant pass that Nikhil Alexander Walker. I mean, if you just want to, I watched it, you know, 50 times today, like everybody else did. And just yeah. watch Carl on that possession. And you'll say that's right there shows you how dedicated he is to this whole deal. And it's got to be easier too, Dan, when you get to the post game and Anthony Edwards has 40 and nine and six. And Ant obviously knows he's the star of this whole thing. And all he does for five minutes is talk about how important Carl was and this is why we need him and this is what I told him. And if he can just stay out of foul trouble like I've been telling him for three days, he's going to be great like this every single night. I think Ant's a great teammate for him to have in this regard because he's he's not worried about sharing the spotlight and the shine. No, he's not, and he's been you know pretty good. He's picked different players, different games. He did that again last night. Somebody for the Athletic, whose name escapes me, I might be James Edwards, is the writer. Yes, wrote an interesting piece that's getting some 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 play today about how, and whether he wants to accept it or not, he's the man, and he's going to have to deal with it, or he's not going to advance to the next step. I, I, I'm not sure I agree with his logic on it. In effect, what he's saying is Ant continues to be, in a sense, like after games, too humble mm-hmm. with the old. After three victory, three nothing leaving the series, we haven't done anything yet. We got to win the fourth game. We got to do this or we got to do that. I haven't really arrived yet. Whatever. That's to me all semantics that actually are encouraging that he does have some, unlike a lot of players, some self awareness. Right, that mm-hmm. he's not first ballot Hall of Fame yet. He's still got some steps to take. On the other hand, what does he do? I would say to James Edwards, respectfully, what does he do on the court, especially as we advanced in this series, last few games, that tells you deep down he thinks he is the dog, as Charles Barkley said. He's got dog in him. He's yep. that guy. He is unstoppable. Nobody is better than me. The way he you know, conducts himself on the court, I think, is proof that he is accepting the mantle that Edwards says he needs to be writer says he needs to but i think verbally i like that he's kind of trying to you know back it off a little bit i'm sure largely because he's reminded of this by the head coach and others you know that there are steps to this thing hell last time we had conley on tim conley on what did he tell us he said we stay on them all we compliment them but yep. we stay on them all the time about the steps all the steps that if you keep on this path there is no telling and i think I didn't tweet this out again, that I've probably done it too many times, but I do think people, I hope, now understand why, and I got mocked for this when I first did it, might have been premature then, it's not anymore, that Anthony Edwards has a chance to be the greatest Minnesota Timberwolf of all time. Is there any longer any question about that? No, I mean... He's 22 years old doing even, stuff yeah. that, that, that's never been... You know, the very few players do that has people I respect... The Barclays, the Shacks, the Kenny Smiths of the world, and others. Sam, uh, this, this dude, yeah, uh, Scalabrini, same thing. This dude's different. You know, he's one of those guys. 
uh, who's, who's, who's wired different and also has a skill set that allows him to do things that rarely are, are being done on a basketball court. Well, he's got KG tweeting out after game three saying, break all the records, kid. You know, he's got KG saying yeah, the same it. thing. Yeah. So yeah. He, he's in the same boat. All right. Uh, get your load management done. Uh, we'll call you in about an hour. And, um, yeah, that's what we got. That's what we know. We'll call you in about an hour. You got Johnny today, you said, and uh, who's, who else? Jace Johnny Frederick coming up right around the corner. He was oh, in nice. Phoenix, so we'll get the – I think he just landed about 45 minutes ago. So Jace from the Pioneer Press, Johnny Athletic, and then um, a bunch of talkbacks on the Timberwolves Talkback Tuesday and Monday. By the way, what's going on? We, 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 there's some gopher player that came to us, like defense. Was it a defensive back or a sa- uh, receiver? The one you talked about? about in the portal, the Division Two guy? Yeah, I don't know anything about it except that he's, he was here and now he's not. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, I, what was your favorite moment? I just I mean, show up. I'm going to show up uh, August 29th, I think, against North Carolina and see who's there. That's that's pretty much what I'm going to do. Yeah, it's what College it is. Football and basketball, man. Mm. All right, have a good one. We'll talk later. Yep, see ya. That's Dan Barrera on the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline. This is Bumper to Bumper. We'll check in with Dan maybe a little bit later in the show. As we mentioned, we got Johnny Athletic at 5.30. Jace Frederick uh, coming up next segment. And get your talkbacks in. Timberwolves talk back Tuesday on a Monday discussing the first sweep ever for the Minnesota Timberwolves and one of your major sports teams. Um, They won a series for the first time in 20 years. I'm pretty sure I still had at least one earring back then. We've got a JJ to JJ connection in Minnesota. Your Vikings took JJ McCarthy in the NFL draft, and you can rep the new JJ to JJ connection with our new shirt. Just head over to KFN.com slash store to snag yours today. KFN.com slash store. JG is Jimmy from Bell Plain. I'll never forget back in the day. When I used to buy Dave Ben's tickets from him after I found him selling them on Craigslist <laughs> for 10 bucks a pop, lower level. How far we've come now, it's unbelievable, man. We've got a legit superstar, a legit, you know, MVP candidate for the next however many years, and I'm just so amped, man. 113 to 111. I want to kill everything in front of me, man. That's the main thing. Dave Ben's catching strays here on a rainy Monday. Welcome back to the 651 Carpets Plus Studios. Guards Ian for Barrero today on Bumper to Bumper. We're here until 630. Johnny Athletic will join at 530. We'll catch up with Dan again at some point in the four. But we head now to a man who just landed from Phoenix within the last hour, covering games three and four, as he is wont to do as the beat writer for the Timberwolves and a million other things for the Pioneer Press, TwinCities.com. He is Jace Frederick on the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline. How are you, man? How was Phoenix? Hey, guards, it was a lot of fun. Um, I think for obvious reasons, it was a fun atmosphere. It was fun to kind of see the celebration last night. It was it was an enjoyable trip. I'll remember that. Take me into the locker room. Take me into the hallway. You guys did that a little bit with the videos from uh, the bowels of Footprint Center. Um, it seemed pretty businesslike. It seemed pretty emphatic. It seemed pretty celebratory. And it seemed like a group that said, this is why we all came here to do this. We were supposed to do this. Maybe not in the fashion you guys thought, sweeping them, but... This is what we expected from this group. Yeah, you kind of forget, like, in the NBA, especially when you never see one, uh, that when a team wins a series, like, there is a little bit. It's not baseball. It's not spring champagne acting like you just won the championship. But uh, it's it, there is definitely, like, a lot of a celebration, like, kind of reflecting even amongst guys, like, talking about players, talking about matchups, uh, just being more open about what they just did over the last week or whatever. Um, and just, like, the general – excitement of it um i think after each game this team has done a really good job of like hey this is business it's one game at a time we got another one all these things um and then when it's like now you don't have anything in front of you for a week here Mm -hmm. uh really kind of soaking in it and enjoying it like i think they took a lot of pride in the sweep i know mike conley was just kind of chatting with us pregame of like i've never had a sweep before like that's kind of something that would be cool to check off my list and uh so he did that and i think there's just a feeling of domination too when you obviously do that to a foe so it was it was a lot of yelling hollering uh kind of like laughing like reminiscing on it uh, it was cool to see that obviously they know and they've talked about about hey there's more after this this is just one series but giving yourself a minute giving yourself a night to uh kind of appreciate all the work you just put into this what was the biggest difference in the series from the last two regular season games where, as you know, because you read the comments, you get the comments, you cover the games, there was a lot of fear and loathing about this 6-3 matchup with the Phoenix Suns that could not be stopped those final two games of the regular season where they played once in Phoenix and then back in Minneapolis. How did the Wolves so effectively flip the script? 
Yeah, I think it was pretty clear um, to anybody watching, and Jaden McDaniel said it last night. He's like, we just upped our physicality. And part of that is they just played harder. Like they, It's not like they hadn't played well, um, but they hadn't been the exact same team, especially defensively. Like that suffocating, how do you even dribble the ball up the court defense <laughs> that they were at the start of the season? Um, they recaptured that. And, uh, and obviously then, like usually with the playoffs with the whistle, and this was definitely true in the first couple games of the series at Target Center, they were allowed to do that. Um, they were allowed to be the most like physical, tough, you know, like, like literally make you fight for every inch on the court, uh, group. And that kind of exposed Phoenix, who doesn't have a point guard, who can't get into anything easy, um, who's got, you know, you've got Devin Booker or Brad Beal, like, having to fight tooth and nail against like a Jaden or Nikhil Alexander Walker just to get across half court. Um, now, now it's 16 seconds left to, to do anything you want to do um, and, and kind of try to run some offense. And that's not easy to do. And there's nobody to really get into it. And then by the third quarter, like when Beal and Booker are having to work really hard just to get the ball up the court, they're spent. Uh, so I think just like Minnesota war Phoenix down with just an amped up physicality that we hadn't really seen from them. Like I think in the end of the regular season, they're maybe at an eight. And then by, by this last week here, they were definitely back up to a 10. What was the biggest difference in Anthony Edwards from those two games where he couldn't do really anything? And we talked a lot about just the, the shell defense that Phoenix was employing. And I think I know the answer is he started just involving his teammates who were spectacular. He couldn't do, I, like, I can't think of like one guy that played consistently bad through these four games. And then when it was time for Ant to go, he was able to do it. So how were they able to unlock that whole thing where Ant essentially became inevitable at some point in the second half each of these games? Yeah, he, he and it really is kind of a continuation of the player that he's become over the last month and a half or so. Um, and it really did it really did start with when Carl went down. Like Ant knows in those situations, like I'm gonna have all the attention on me. Um and that and that was the case and, and he just made a better effort this time than other times when he hasn't had Carl of how do I take advantage of them loading up on me and finding others and really trusting that and teammates really kind of gaining confidence in themselves and their own aggression and, and not being shy, not turning shots down. Like everybody knew like, okay, this is my time right now to shoot the ball. This is my time to attack the rack. Uh, so that, and then that really did just kind of carry forward. And I think at the end of the regular season, Carl was still kind of working his way back in. And so, like, Minnesota played Atlanta and then Phoenix. And on that weekend, it didn't play great neither. And I think right. there's a little bit of a natural reacclimation period there. As Cat works his way back in and, like, reintegrates and kind of works his way back into playing shape and rhythm and all of that. Uh, but then by with that week of practice, I think that was really huge. And then they were able to, like, throw every look that Phoenix was going to throw at Ant at practice where they went hard for, like, three days. And you show Ant something enough, he'll figure it out. Um, and he already kind of had built in that muscle memory of, like, okay, I get off it here, I get off it here, I get off it here, it'll come back to me. Um, and it really did kind of loosen up Phoenix to where he said, you know, in the second half last night, like, they were done doubling. Uh, that Because that had not worked for them either. Um, so then they were just kind of like, all right, make Ant beat us. Uh, and there's a lot more just straight switches. And, and Ant attacked that a lot of times getting to the rim. He attacked it with his jumper, obviously, that started to fall. And it was really the perfect balance, and he's found that in this last six, seven weeks of this perfect balance of how you adjust – via how the defense is attacking you um, to kind of make whatever look they are giving you work against them. Um, and he's doing it right 90% of the time, which is which makes it really tough for defenses. I watched the Carl and Ant press conference last night. I've probably watched it, Jace, maybe 15 times in its totality uh, in the last 12 <laughs> to 18 hours. The stretch about Ant, and we're going to play it on the show, I had multiple people um, on beep patrol to make sure that we got every swear word out. But the part where Ant was talking to Carl about the fouls to me is as good as it gets in a press conference setting. Um, as you, you, you know, you've been in a million of them. I just couldn't get enough of that. I've shown it to like everybody in my life. Uh, and we're going to play it here probably right after your appearance. But what did that vibe and what did that press conference last night kind of tell you about those two, that relationship as really the, the two main key cogs in this Wolves machine for however far it goes this year and wherever it goes in years after this. Yeah, I think for me it was a continuation of what Ant has done with Carl for a long time now. And that Ant knows Carl gets criticism. Um, Ant knows that Carl probably does have to like doesn't get to play exactly the way he wants to play at all times these types of things and and he knows that like carl's always under this microscope of like hey he makes bad passes and whatnot people are going to jump down his throat uh so anta has always kind of been carl's biggest like cheerleader you know of like oh we need carl carl's the most important player on the team carl carl is the best offensive player on our team like he does that time and time again and it's like oh did carl have any games where he 
maybe we didn't have like this massive impact and it's like, well, that was cause he's in foul trouble, mm-hmm. you know, like, and just like, we write that off to that right there and you see what it's like when he's not in foul trouble tonight. Like, uh, he is constantly always gassing Carl up for or lack of a better term, like really like pumping up his tires and like, we need you. You've been great. You give us exactly what we need. Keep it going. Um, he he answers a pretty big relationship guy of knowing what to do with every person. And with Carl, it is always kind of boosting up his confidence, knowing that that's how you're going to get the best version of Carl at City Town. So I think that kind of is like the social intelligence that Ant displays really on a daily basis. We're talking with Jace Frederick, Pioneer Press. Follow him at Jace Frederick on X. You can read his stuff at TwinCities.com. Put a bunch of stuff out yesterday before Game 4. I'm sure we'll have a lot coming up this week as the Wolves await their next opponent. It's either Denver or the Los Angeles Lakers. If Denver wins tonight, that series will start in Denver on Saturday. If the Lakers win, the series will start wherever um, on Monday, I believe. Um, and the way what struck me too, Jace, is the, on the stuff about the the fouling. It I can imagine Jimmy Butler saying that to him, or Michael Jordan saying that to him. But it was not what he said; it's how he says it. Like even though he's what six years younger than Carl, he's almost like the big brother. Like, hey man, I, I'm telling you this. Like I told you this. I've showed you the way. Like. Just stop fouling. Just stop bleeping fouling, and everything will be fine. It's like a playful, but I'm serious, and get it together, and then we're going to be great. I just think the method that he does it is, I don't know if it's new agey. I don't know if it's brothery. I don't know what it is, but it's awesome. I, I just think it's the perfect approach with a guy like Carl. Everything Ant says, like, even if he's giving you straight answers, like, there's, like, some humor to it, just like the way he's saying it. You can't help but, like, smile or laugh a little bit at it. And the same exact thing comes off with, like, his instruction or criticism of any teammate. Like, he will yell across the locker room, like, you need to shoot more. You need to do this. You need to be better here. Like, right in front of everybody. But yet the person who he's doing it to, like, always just kind of smirks and not, <laughs> you know? Like, and, like, and it's not like you don't feel like you're getting yelled at or called out. It's just, like, that's just Ant being Ant. But the message also still gets through. Uh, so, like, it, it is kind of something unlike that I've seen before because he really does hold players to account. He holds himself to account. Um, but even if he's, like, seemingly yelling at you, it doesn't feel like that. It never does. Uh, so that, I don't know. It's it's a skill. It's a luxury for Minnesota. Like, But I, I just don't really think he's ever going to get under somebody's skin just because of the way it always comes off to everybody. Well, and even when he says 28 and 10 for Cat, I don't think he sacrificed much. You know, when he's not, like, that's just another, that's just a good playful needle, too, of, like, he's getting his, too. Like, we're all eating. Um, so tell me about the Cat that you saw this series as a guy who has been criticized, who has been through a lot, who has a huge microscope on him for how he, you know, is all over the officials. And by the way, I think this was also a good series uh, instructive to say like whatever we think of Ant being mad and getting texts and Carl and Finchie and everybody it's like look around man I mean I'm so glad we don't have to watch the Phoenix Suns and the flopping and the flailing and Booker complaining about everything I'm glad we don't have to do that for another year at least but what did you see from Carl like was this a big growth series for him like should this now be the expectation just for all around Carl uh, defensively with the refs offensively not driving out of control taking what the defense is giving him it seemed like just a really mature series from a guy who's in his ninth year yeah and honestly with the resting um the complaining i think minnesota made a really concerted effort and this probably also was part of their week-long prep to not do that um because they certainly have been a team that does it a, a lot as well um along with a lot of other teams but that even went to chris finch who complained to the refs less than I've ever seen him do all season. Like, mm. This is usually a guy who is standing on the sideline and every single trip down <laughs> saying something to the official, and he didn't say like hardly anything. And I could tell like that was a concerted effort on his part. Um, to kind of think, kind of trying to set a tone there, and I think Minnesota did a pretty good job with it. You're always going to have some times where you go up, you throw your hands up, whatever. Uh, but, but I think they did a really good job there. For Carl, yeah, I think it was just like a – maybe like the most comfortable he's ever been in his skin and his role with this team. So like maybe I think sometimes feeling like you've got a little less to prove or you understand more what's required um, when I think it does sometimes help. Like I'm interested to see in this team, like if they play Denver and they're down 12 in the third quarter, how do they react then? Sure. Uh, They they were just constantly in control in the series. So I think everybody was always comfortable. I really do like, and, and that's the point where when you're kind of rolling and everybody's playing well and, and maybe you can just keep that going all the way through. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, where you just keep continuing doing the right thing and staying composed. Um, Carl, I think, did a great job of that. Like, offensively yesterday, it was a perfect mix. Like, he started off by just taking a lot of threes, and that is the best part of his game. And then I think he did a pretty good job being picky uh, with the drives and, like, knowing when it was advantageous to do so. And then the biggest thing was just being as active as he was on the glass, tough defensive boards. 
Uh, defensively, like, I'm going to be honest, like, Carl in his postgame presser last night said, I didn't foul because I didn't play as much defense. And I actually agree with that. I know, like, in that around the horn play with the last 230 left, like, Carl had some really good rotations there. But you know, that ant block on Booker, like, Booker kind of went around Carl like a traffic cone there. Like, yeah. that was maybe some of Carl's worst ball contained that I've seen uh, all series, but it probably did contribute less to the foul. So there is probably some give and take there. Uh, but I, I just think like everything else he did um, was really measured. Um, and, and at other points in the series, when he's playing 23 minutes or something, he's just taking advantage of the time when he's out there and understanding here's my time to supply a scoring burst. Um, so it is kind of like doing basically what everybody's doing right now, which is giving the team what they need in that moment. And maybe Ant, they need more from, but everybody else is just doing what they need, and that is maximizing kind of the sum of all the parts here. Last couple of minutes with Jace Frederick, Pioneer Press. Follow him at Jace Frederick on X. TwinCities.com for all of his great work covering this team all season long. Covers a bunch of stuff, specifically the Wolves here at this time of the year. So what do we make of Rudy not being played off the court? As everybody told us, especially against a smaller team, it seemed like Rudy, I mean, Rudy was guarding everybody. Rudy was out. Rudy was, you know, 30 feet away from the basket. There was nowhere for Phoenix's big three to really go if Rudy was on the floor. Is this the Rudy that, obviously, this is kind of a stupid question. This is everything that they could have hoped for with Rudy Gobert, right, when they made this trade for what he brought all season defensively, but certainly in this series. Yeah, 100%. That's a huge defensive tone. Like, you could see it last night. Like, Wolves were not as good defensively last night. And part of that's because Rudy Gobert did not play as many minutes. Because, and it sucks for Carl. Like, they, he just gets spammed in pick and rolls. Um, because then he's the big out there. And they were just attacking, attacking, attacking. Where, like, that's usually Rudy. And it's hard to do that. Um, because if you meet Rudy at the rim, like, you're probably going to lose. Or you're just going to shy away from it, frankly. Like, he, he sets such a tone. And, like, the comfort he has switching, and we've seen that all year. Um, he is great switching onto wings and guards. I mean, and really forcing contested shots, and oftentimes like not even giving you the oxygen to like take that step back jumper that guards often settle for against big men. Like you can't go really like it's if you're gonna go by him, you might do it like once or twice. It's really hard. Um, and everything else is just nothing is easy on those switches. And I would say like I remember watching those Utah games, um, and I remember especially like in Rudy's last year there. Um, the lack of effort anybody else gave defensively and just watching Rudy like have no choice but to sprint in to try to protect the rim. Yep. And then they would kick out to Rudy's guy and no one on earth can <laughs> run back straight out to the corner and get out to a shooter and nobody on the wing would rotate down so you wouldn't get any of like that Wolves with like 2.30 left or whatever last night. Everybody rotating over, over, over. No one on Utah rotated over. So it's just Rudy's guy left alone as Rudy's trying to sprint after sprinting into the paint, trying to sprint back out. And then the guy would make the three and it'd be like, Rudy, it's like, right. I don't, he can't give up the layup, <laughs> um, which the guy beat the guy at the top of the perimeter. Uh, he's got to do something to stop that. And then I guess if he's not going to get any help on his guy in the corner, like what is the guy to do? I'm not surprised at all that with a competent defense around him, uh, he can continue to be dominant um, no matter the situation. If I'm going to be cocky on run it back Island, like I have been all season with Max Fuller, Craig Kilborn, and one of us Hollywood actor guy, Josh Broughton, the only four of us on Run It Back Island uh, to bring this team back and see what they are. I have to be, um, I have to be, I guess, transparent. And you have the receipts of this, as does Johnny Athletic, and I think a lot of those other guys that I just mentioned. I was extremely concerned with Jaden McDaniels this season. Um, you know that. I think I wore you out with those texts. I'm like, what's he doing? How can they count on him? I'm worried about his shooting. I'm worried about his turnovers. I get the defense, but... He's got to bring something extra. Wow, he did. Um, starting with game two, where he was just tremendous. Uh, the dunk last night, notwithstanding, I think he finished with 18 points. What did he unlock in himself on both ends of the court to be as really the guy that they paid all this money to, right? And the guy that they thought was worth investing to this level. He was spectacular. Yeah, he really was. Uh, and I think uh, I think a big part of it is like getting to play more physically, uh, maybe kind of gets him going a little bit def like defensively, maybe sparks his offense a little bit, gives him more license, I think, to feel like he can be aggressive. Um, and I do think, and we saw this like for pieces of when Carl was out and hit, I mean, Jaden had a couple good games in there as and was really getting everybody involved. Um, and then, it, but it was, it was a roller coaster, and there were, certainly were games where, like, it was like, all right, he's not doing it tonight. Um, I think he's done a good job not relying as much on that jumper, which has really kind of failed him this year. Uh, sub 34% from three on a lot of really open looks in the corner. That's not good. Um, he hit a huge one last night. He's got to keep taking it when it's wide open, but I think he's done a good job, like, being more cognizant of attacking closeouts, straight line drives, get to the bucket, uh, 
you know, throw down a huge dunk when it's there for him. So I think just being more decisive, but I really do think like the aggressiveness he's allowed to play with defensively, uh, the fewer, the less often he'll be in foul trouble as he gets to be more aggressive. Like that really does allow him to get in more of a rhythm that leads to more confidence on the offensive end. I know you got to fly, so I'll get you out of here on this. Your early impressions, let's assume it's Denver that they take care of the Lakers either tonight or in game six and host game one either Saturday or Monday in Denver. It's a rematch of last year's first round. As you know, what are your early impressions about this potential series? Yeah, I think it'll be way different in that Minnesota is fully healthy and Denver does not have the same rotation that did a year ago. Like Reggie Jackson was on the end of the bench last year. Now he's their backup point guard. uh, And you can see he's very up and down as a player. Um, They've had Peyton Watson in, who's like a pretty good young defensive player. Um, He's not as consistent, not as offensively adept as Bruce Brown was. So Denver, I think it's fair to say is probably a little worse, even if like their season long numbers don't bear that out. Um, I just think though that their starting five is still elite um, and really good and connected and Jokic, for as great as Ant is, Jokic is still the best player in the series. That's, yep. There's really no denying that. Um, so that, like, Denver has home court advantage and the best player. And usually that gives you a pretty big advantage. But Minnesota does have so many different things they can try, so many different looks they can throw at him, so many different ways they can maybe wear Jamal Murray down. Um, that I think it's going to be really competitive, and I think it'll be long because it's hard to win in Denver. Uh, but Minnesota's done that this year, and that obviously was the game Jamal Murray didn't play in. But they've been really competitive with Denver in the past, and I wouldn't really expect anything different tonight, I mean, uh, this week. Um, but how about, like, I think they could really use those two extra days for Chris Finch's sake. Yeah, uh, I meant to ask you about so, that. What, what what do we know about what he's going to do here? Yeah, no, we don't know for sure. Like, the setup, I think, is still kind of to be determined, but I think he's going to have surgery, like, middle of this week. and. I had a buddy and like a high school friend who suffered that same injury last month. And I know those first couple of days post surgery, like it's not like you can do very much. Right. right. You're in a lot of pain and that leg is just straight up. So I don't know how involved he can even be in practice this week. I think it'll maybe be, you know, helping put the plans together, but probably not execution. Um, I think if the game, if the series starts Monday, I wouldn't be surprised if he can maybe be like down there, um, you know, yep. in the back row or whatever. Uh, but I, if they play Saturday, I'd be pretty surprised if that's the setup or maybe if he's not, kind of elsewhere during the game so more time i think is better for them um but i wouldn't be surprised at all if as the series goes along they can kind of do it you're in the second row set up um having pretty constant communication with guys having guys come sit by him if he gives a message or whatever just another mini chapter for the wild timberwolves book the head coach with How about a, it patellar tendon injury as you're trying to sweep for the first time in franchise history you're the best man thanks for fitting me in enjoy the family this week before you head out to denver and we'll talk to you soon Appreciate it. Jace Frederick on the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline. Follow him at Jace Frederick on X on Twitter and TwinCities.com. Timberwolves talkbacks when we come back. And why did the Timberwolves sweep the Phoenix Suns? We'll outline how they remembered who 